On August 30th, 2023, Hurricane Idalia made landfall and ravaged Florida's Big Bend. And you know what's in the area? Pelicamp, our North Florida retreat. This area had not been hit by a major hurricane in over a hundred years. We monitored our remote cameras incessantly until we saw a tree fall across the street. The first of many, and then power went out. We had no way of knowing the extent of the damage until a few days later when neighbors and friends sent a few pictures. It didn't look good. We had to leave soon for the Hershey RV show anyway, so we decided to leave a few days early, assess the damage, and then continue. This will be a true RV lifestyle road trip, as we're gonna stay at a truck stop, at a KOA, mooch docking with friends, and even at Cracker Barrel. We'll eat the local fast food and cook our own meals, and let's see what other trouble we can get ourselves into. Then, after the Hershey RV show, we'll go to Ohio for the Farm Science Review. We'll visit the National Museum of the Air Force and the Armstrong Air and Space Museum. We'll attend the M23 YouTube Meetup, the RV Hall of Fame in Elkhart. And then, fun in Asheville. Our late summer 2023 adventure begins now. I'm riding. Riding in my RV, my RV, wherever I want to be. Because I'm free in my RV. Yeah. We're living at sunrise, so we can get to Pelly Camp early enough so that we can figure things out. Morning. It's been five days since uh, Hurricane Idalia destroyed a lot of stuff on the, on the Florida Panhandle coast, and uh, that's where our North Florida retreat Pelly Camp is located. And uh, we've seen pictures. We've lost our shed. We've lost some some trees. So we're driving up to do a little bit of cleaning up. So um, here we go. We're taking the turnpike, which many years ago I vowed never to take again, only to eat my words once we bought Pelican. It is still boring, but without a doubt, by far the quickest and most efficient way. get close to the area, we see a lot of downed trees and power lines. You can tell a major storm went through here, but they are working on their recovery already. Anyway, we've made it to Pelly Camp. Let's get a first look from the outside because we're not going to be able to do that later. Oh boy. I think the main thing here is going to be clearing this driveway. So we'll take it one branch at a time. I'm happy to report that Taylor the Pelican made it. That's a good omen. Well, it seems like the well is unscathed. All right, let's back. Let's back in the trailer in here. And uh, and as I said, one stick at a time. I 
I did a video about all this right after it happened, so I'm not gonna repeat myself. I'll just put a link to that video right here. I don't know if you can tell, but it is hot out there. <laughs> well, today we begin a... Let me lower the AC a little bit. Today we begin a new mini adventure here. Uh, obviously, we're going to the Hershey RV show, which of course, by the time this video comes out, you would have already seen those videos. Um, but uh, we're gonna make a little road trip out of it. So, let's do it. Let's see if I can make the turnaround here in Pelicamp, because I believe it is narrower than before. In fact, Minitini 3 may not have made it. We'll be back in a couple of weeks for the cleanup. There are trees and debris piled up everywhere. This is gonna take a while. This hurricane certainly put Perry on the map, if only for a few days. We're now driving through downtown Perry, typical small town America. It is quite nice actually. And there's not that much hurricane damage considering what the storm did to all the trees. They call this area Forest Capital of Florida. And now, after going under I-10, we'll soon be in Georgia. Welcome to Georgia. Oh, thank you. We don't have a super long drive today. We're staying at Love's RV Stop in Cordell. Over the past couple of years, Love's Travel Stops, they have been developing RV parks in their truck stops, which are, I must say, hit or miss. But this one seems to be one of the newer and nicer ones. When you make the reservation online, you get a text and an email with the gate code and the link to check in, which you must click in order to turn on the power pedestal. These are all right off the interstate, so very convenient to overnight on a long road trip. I have never had Bojangles before, so let's check it out. You know, fried chicken is one of my favorite things. Mmm, fried chicken. Bon appetit. Well, just encountered a viewer back there. It's getting dark here. Beautiful, beautiful afternoon here at the Loves. And I don't know if, if I was really hungry or I had never had Bo's before, but it might be my new favorite fried chicken. I don't know. And uh, another thing about this Love's RV stop, if this one becomes the, like, the, the template for all the other ones, right? I think some of, some of the, the small ones we've been to, they have been, like, made after the fact. This is a brand new Love's. They did it from scratch, and it's like, a, like, like an honest-to-God RV park. I mean, all they need is a swimming pool, really. So, uh, I mean, they even have, like, a, like a water park for, for kids back there. This is probably the best one we stayed at so far. I believe it was like $42. It isn't cheap. It isn't cheap for for being right here next to the semi-trucks, but it is clean, everything works. Quick overnight right next to I-75. That's all we really needed tonight. Tomorrow, but we don't know exactly where we're going yet. Good morning. Time really got away from us this morning, let me tell you. It's uh, five minutes till, till noon, which is checkout time here at the, at the Love's RV stop. And we're gonna drive about three hours towards Appalachia. Hopefully, the temperatures will be a little cooler up there. Slowly making our way. Oh, we need to get propane. Well, as much as I praise the RV park, I feel the opposite about this particular Love's. These are the rudest, most inept people I've encountered in a very long time. I 
as I said earlier, time has really gotten away from us today. I mean, we wasted about a half an hour in that loves. I mean, nobody knows what they're doing in there. That loves is not getting my business again unless I'm running on fumes. And um, well, now we're gonna see if we can get some sausages and we'll get to whatever. We, we don't have a reservation today, so whenever we get to wherever we get, whenever four o'clock hits, unless we are stuck in traffic in Atlanta, Whenever four o'clock hits, we're gonna look for an RV park. We're back on I-75, and there are several places along the way that sell sausages, pecans, you know, local Georgia products. And today we're not in any particular hurry, so we're going to visit a couple of those. Like Ellis Brothers, for example. They have a pretty large billboard. Let me tell you, advertising works. I believe some of these are pecan trees. Well, let's go get some pecans in Georgia. It's so hot. Pecans, peaches, it doesn't get much more Georgia than that, right? Yep, these are my favorite. Well, we went nuts because we're nuts. We got some nuts and some cheese. Next up, Perry, Perry, Georgia. Here at this fairgrounds is where the Family Motor Coach Association holds their annual rally. I'm not a member, so I've never been. And the reason we're here, sausages. By the way, it looks like it is going to rain. We always see all these country stores advertised on billboards along the interstate. And we've been to SL and Carol's. And today we're trying striplings. Well, we got pecans, we got sausages and wine, actually. <laughs> what else could we possibly need? Oh, Bucky's! Ooh, maybe the hurricane came through here, too. Experiencing a very refreshing rain here in Georgia. Actually, it's starting to rain harder. Let's hurry up. Bucky's. <laughs> one We're gonna get ourselves some Texas barbecue in Georgia. Well, here's lunch, maybe even dinner too. Oh, it's, it's raining hard now. Let's do it. Got the brisket sandwich, as always, and a cheesesteak burrito. It's probably good. Well, a little bit of a change of plan. We're gonna stay at a at a KOA, actually, one that we've never stayed at. Uh, we called a couple of places that didn't answer the phone. A lot of places were fully booked because tomorrow is Friday, and sometimes it's just convenient. We have decided to avoid Atlanta altogether and take a slightly more easterly route. Here we are, and the minute we arrive, we realize we've been here before. This is the one with all the rail cars. Ooh, 
Ooh, this site is pretty steep. Well, we'll see how it goes. And I just realized we've been here before. This is not gonna be great for Starlink, but there's some AT&T and there's some Verizon, so we should be okay. Um, I may or may not unhitch today. Maybe tomorrow we'll go uh, explore the area a little bit. There's bad weather coming, so we're just gonna hunker down, get some work done, and tomorrow we'll continue north. At least we got to do a couple of the things that, uh, you know, because I'm always in a hurry. I had never been able to do like like stop at one of the sausage places and, uh, and yeah we, we made some of the, the stops that we wanted to make and then the day after tomorrow we're gonna spend some time uh, with our friends in Waynesville and then then Hershey Pennsylvania <laughs> it's a nice campground it's a very steep site to to back it in here we did it Let's go for a walk around the campground. Actually, it is a very nice RV park, and you can tell there are some permanent residents, which can be a negative sometimes, but everything looks pretty well maintained and clean. Let's check out the beach area. We definitely owe it to ourselves to spend more time here and enjoy the facilities. Maybe even rent a pontoon boat if I can learn how to drive it. These pontoons, they look like they've seen better days, but apparently they do rent them here. If and when we come back, we do want one of these lakefront sites. Maybe if I ever get a boat, bring it here. These are pretty cool. Oh, very nice campground. I mean, there's not a square inch of, uh, of flat terrain here, but yeah. So, sometime we must return and get one of those lakefront sites or one of the pull throughs back there with the little veranda. Let's grill some of the goodies we bought at Striplings yesterday. Hello everybody. Yes, yeah, you can see we're, uh, you know, grilling some of the stuff we bought yesterday. The skewers seem to be a Canadian product, believe it or not. And, well, this afternoon we'll see what we do. It's gonna be mostly a work day, which is kind of a waste of such a beautiful place, but sometimes you gotta do it. Of course, we chose the one place without Starlink to, to make it a work day, but...
going to town, into Greensboro. There's a brewery called Oconee Brewing Company. We gotta treat ourselves after a long day of work. But we had to do it. Videos had to be edited. Our time at home base in Miami was a lot shorter than expected because of the hurricane. I was hoping to catch up on work, but couldn't. Well, here we are, Oconee Brewing. Chero Cola, never heard of it. And they have a food truck. Oconee Brewing. where they make the beer. Cheers. Today we continue north. Destination Waynesville, North Carolina. We're going to Mooch Dock with longtime friends Roberto and Zulema. Roberto, fellow musician, band leader. It is a nice, easy drive on the back roads of Georgia. Not necessarily scenic, not yet anyway, but it certainly beats the White Knuckle Atlanta crossing. Driving through some of these small towns, it almost feels like we've jumped back in time, into a different era. Here we are, going over I-85, and these types of commercial areas by the interstate, they all kind of look the same. Oh, I see mountains in the distance, we are approaching the Appalachians. Oh, it was all going so well. What's going on here? What's going on over there? At least from afar, it doesn't look very serious, but I could be wrong. It looks like he's trying to put a hook on it. Yep, yep. he's pulling it. It is kind of tangled up on the fence, but he's making progress. Yep. Hopefully we'll be underway soon. the color 
or changes on the road, boom. Welcome to North Carolina. Welcome to North Carolina. Oh, thank you. This is one of my favorite drives, US 23, the Great Smoky Mountains Expressway. Here we are. There's no need to unhitch or drive today. Zoo is gonna be our DD. So we're going downtown to an old familiar place. Believe me, this is like the fourth time we moosh dog here. Roberto and I have played together for several years, since at least the mid 2000s, so there are many stories to tell. Mostly retell. He's originally from Santiago in eastern Cuba. And while the vegetation is somewhat different, the topography is certainly reminiscent of the Sierra Maestra Mountains. I think it is cool they decided to move to this area. Here we are arriving in downtown Waynesville, and we're going to take a wild guess. A brewery! This one is called Frog Level Brewing Company, named after the historic district where it is located. I guess most people are outside because there is live music. Well, that was a lot of fun. Let me tell you something, I wouldn't mind at all getting a piece of land somewhere around here, surrounded by all these mountains. Pelicamp, Appalachia perhaps? Someday? Let's go into Asheville. Roberto has been telling me about Sunday brunch at this rooftop Cuban restaurant with live music and they have been going pretty much every Sunday. He's got his maracas and his cajon and the yearning to get his music fix. Here's the famous Grove Arcade, so we're going to park somewhere around here. We've made it to Asheville. May the festivities begin. Roberto got the cajon, and we're good. This is the famous Grove Arcade. Very cool. I think we have to go across the street at the Cambria. No, I say it's Cambria. It's Cambusa. Of course, the rooftop affords great views of the Blue Ridge. We haven't even sat down at our table and Roberto is already on stage singing. I think we're going to revisit Asheville on the return trip. It is such a cool town. We've been here before, but there's still a couple of places I want to explore, so we'll revisit the San Francisco of the South towards the tail end of this trip. I got a mojito and Illy got something called Sundown in Havana. Cassava fries, croquettes, empanadas. 
while Roberto and Kubusa band keep at it on stage. I don't know how much of this I can show you without getting in trouble with the copyright owners, although a lot of these Cuban traditional tunes must be in the public domain by now. Well, at least you get a taste of what it was like. As the sun wants to come out, here's one last view of the Blue Ridge as we're getting ready to head back to Waynesville and then say goodbye, as we must continue towards Hershey, Pennsylvania. Yeah, that's where we're going. This was filmed in September 2023, and we are on our way to the Hershey RV show. journey continues. We still have many miles ahead of us. Asheville, see you in a couple of weeks. Taking I-26 West, crossing the mountains into Tennessee. Almost at the top. And do you know what's at the top? The state line. Welcome to Tennessee. It always amazes me how the weather can change once you cross a mountain range. hour later, we are in Virginia. Here's a little bit of trivia. This town, Withville, is the place where we dry camped for the first time, at Walmart. I don't think this Walmart allows overnight parking anymore, but Cracker Barrel does, so that's where we're staying. All the reviews online said it was a steep hill, and it is. It is also a little tight, but we'll manage. Anyway, let's go eat. Beautiful setting here. It is fried chicken Sunday. Cracker barrel with a view, but very off level. It is going to be another almost all day drive to Hershey, Pennsylvania, so I won't bore you with the minutia. Crossing into West Virginia, which is probably the state with the most peculiar shape, it's got pan handles sticking out in almost every direction. And now crossing the Potomac into Maryland. And the Mason-Dixon line into Pennsylvania. That would be Harrisburg, the capital. The next few days you've already seen, our almost annual pilgrimage to the Hershey RV show. But just in case you haven't, I'll put a link to that playlist. For the first few nights, we were able to book the last available site at the Hershey Park campground. Had we been a few feet longer, we would have been out of luck. From the Hershey RV Show 2023 Hershey RV Show here.
we're gonna spend one night at a campground near Pittsburgh so we can do laundry, dump our tanks, all that good stuff. And then we're going to Ohio to attend Farm Science Review, a show about farming equipment and the latest technologies in agriculture. I'm actually really excited about this. Ever since I was able to travel cross-country, when I started doing YouTube full-time back in 2017, I've been fascinated by all the farming equipment and infrastructure I've seen on the road, particularly in the so-called flyover states, where most of our food comes from. We're meeting up with Jim and Barb and their daughter, son-in-law and grandchildren at Madison County Fairgrounds in London, Ohio, a little over half an hour west of Columbus, and Jim has been a fundamental part in the creation of this video. It was at his cousin's farm two years ago that I got to ride on a combine harvesting soy, and now here we are, about to find out how all this stuff works. Jim and Barb have arrived. And just in time for another episode of Fun with the Forest, here we are at the Madison County Fairgrounds in London, Ohio. And uh, tomorrow we're gonna, or maybe, maybe right now, say hello, Jim. All right. We're gonna see some farm equipment. Yep. Yeah, yeah, tonight. You're gonna get to see what I do if you're interested, and then All tomorrow right. the big show with the crowd. Well, everybody say hello to Barb and Jim. And, uh, yeah. Rider and Journey. Rider and Journey, that's the journey from four years ago. Yeah. The baby you held. Well, Jim insisted I drove his truck towing his fifth wheel. I think he wants me to upgrade to an HDT. Turn it off a minute. Turn back to yeah. Oh, well, that's a clear minute. All right, now forward. And let it go through all its buzzers. Hold on, it doesn't yeah. go all the way now. Yeah, like he, it's a aftermarket. There. there you go. All right. The only knob oh, you need to push in is the yellow one. Oh, this is cushioning. Okay, the yellow? Yellow one, top one. Push right. that in. Push. It is okay, well that's part of the thing then. Go get and out And let's take it back to this line to be in drive. Uh, it's automatic. Yeah, oh, that's it. One notch work. There you are. All and right. the rest is just drive yourself straight ahead. It's like driving a, a Class A motorhome. It'll hesitate for a second. Okay. There it goes. Now go to the right. All right. Oh, you don't on. have to do anything there. No, I'm not doing anything. I'm going to just... Uh, make no. Oh, there the you go. Push it harder. And there you go. Push it hard enough. Okay. Yeah. That's the air brake. Yeah. Okay. Oh, you're good. I believe it, it's, it'll turn easier than your, your camp, current yeah, camper. Yeah, I'm, st I'm still looking at your camper on the rear view mirror. I don't want to. So, no, which you're way fine. do I go? You're going to make a left. Make a left here. Uh, it will follow you about we right have, where you want to go. We have plenty of room here. All right. Should I floor it? Yeah. <laughs> Hey, drive faster, Robert. So it's automatic. You don't have to be figuring out the 12 nope. gears anymore. Nope. Okay, how do we do this? Just, just follow the curve around. Just going around. Just, All the just way? Go, yeah, just go around to the back. All right. I finally got Robert to drive to pull a fifth wheel trailer. It's no bigger there, than do. Yep. yep, just put it in neutral. No neutral, there. There, and then pull the yellow knob. No, I didn't break it. So you don't have He's a park, you, you don't have a park. That, that is your park in the that, air brake. That is the air brake. Okay. Yeah, because the red one is your tra trailer brake on a commercial trailer. It don't All apply right. to a camper. Oh. You need to leave it running a minute. I got to move right. it anyways. Yeah. And Robert, All right. Well, that was fun, man. Thanks. <laughs> hey, Ryder, what do you think? Did he do good? Alright, anchors away. We're gonna get a behind the scenes look at, at the farm science review. Alright, we're almost there. Jim and Barb, they own a dust control business, and now I get to ride with him as he sprays some of the roads around the exhibit area. It is a great backstage look at what we're going to see tomorrow. He told me that you spray that product enough times, it almost becomes like hardtop. It makes a great difference. 
We've got such great weather on this late summer day here in Ohio. We are now at the Gwen Conservation Area, which is also owned by the Ohio State University, part of Farm Science Review. Too bad it is getting dark, and here it looks like they're going to be showcasing some plants. And there's a creek! I'm so looking forward to tomorrow, because I've never been to a show like this. And as I mentioned, I've been curious about this stuff for a very long time. That being said, by now you probably know this is not gonna be one of my regular travel shows. In fact, we're gonna dive pretty deep into some of the equipment and how they function, so if you ever wondered, like me, how this stuff works, I invite you to stick around. We're gonna learn a lot. Today coming to you from London, Ohio, and here we are at the Ohio, at the Ohio State University's Farm Science Review. So uh, I got my media pass, and yeah, today we're doing something different. And I'm cleaned up. Ah, yeah, he cleaned up. <laughs> here we are. Hey, G. So I, this I is think we're lost. Jim's looking at the map. I, I think we're lost here, but. Um, Let's see, I have no idea what to expect. I don't know where we're going, but all I see is a lot of farming equipment everywhere. So here we are, stopped at this first exhibit. Uh, let me show you what I found. I found my next drone. Take a look at that. I think if you could fit a small, small person. Uh, Jim, what do they use these drones for? Tell oh, that young man, he'll tell you about yeah. it. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, what do, you, what do you guys use these drones for? So these drones are used for spraying agricultural products. Oh, okay, I see. Yep. So it's like a modern uh, crop duster kind of pretty thing? Pretty much. Yeah, pretty, pretty much, much, right? Except for nobody's just sitting yeah. in it. Yeah. <laughs> yep, and, it holds 110 and, pounds. And they're DJI, right? Yeah. DJI, yep, oh, DJI. Cool. This is the Mavic 3 Enterprise. I need to upgrade at some point. Very interesting to see all these special purpose drones here things we could not see anywhere else. That's why I wanted to come here. Although, I must confess, I was not expecting drones. We're approaching the Case IH display, and I think this is where we're gonna spend most of the time. Jim seems to be a fan, so we're gonna go over all these different machines and learn how they work. Some of them seem obvious, but some don't. At least to the untrained eye. All these vintage tractors, they seem to keep growing over the years. All right, let's start here. Well, as you guys know, I'm a city person and at a place like this, it shows. So I have no idea what this stuff, this stuff is used for. I'm assuming it's... That's, uh, that's corn. That's corn? We'll gather in. And then that guys it runs through the throat right. and does the rest, just like like Bob with you did on the soybean. Right. And uh, the next one I'm assuming is soybean. Soybean and wheat. All right. So it's small grains. Yeah. So, so somebody came up with the idea. They engineered all these uh, machines, you know, to depending on the plant you want to harvest. Right. This is pretty cool. Look at that. All this stuff. And it's actually all, unlike years ago, it's quick connect. Um. Uh, we don't want to break it. Oh, there we go. One okay. Lever releases the hydraulics. One thing for electric. Release the PTL. Drop the head. Uh, cool. And go ahead and hop. Look up. at look at the size of these tires. It's, it's taller than me almost. And here we are. Let's pretend we're gonna drive this. Look at this. Look at the windshield on this thing. This is a, like a panoramic. And uh, yeah, it would be cool to know what all of this does. But, oh, right. the seat goes up and down. And then, very comfortable. And these foot pegs are just for resting your feet when you're resting your feet. And this would be uh, the accelerator, I'm break. assuming. No and brake. Uh, brake. Everything is controlled or oh, reverse. Okay. And different switches for the speeds. Uh, I mean, I don't know everyone on here. So. Yeah, this one is a... 
because I Bob runs one, yeah. it, but there's different because you can tell that's meant for the header because it's right. The it triangle. has that. Yeah. But hey, I'm trying to see if I see RMP. Yeah, uh, B, a, here's a P. Here's now a that's P. A parking. P H L high low. As I'm assuming, yeah. and this. Uh, I was trying to and here on the screen you see like all your stats, right? Yeah, like how, yeah. how many pounds of, uh, of grain you have bushels and whatnot, and, yeah. Bushels and stuff. I I, well, to see. We, we got a stereo so you don't get bored while you are, you know, harvesting. Everything's emergency shut off, but everything's, yeah, you know, everything's forward, there, yeah. reverse. One of these days, one of these days we're going to make a video of me driving one of these. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe before the days. But over. I love this panoramic window, man. This is like you. <laughs> you know, farming is not as hard as it used to be. <laughs> well, well me mental stress, mental Men hard. Mental, mental hard, but <laughs> if you can get one of these, this is beautiful. Check it out under the seat. The jump it's seat. Cooler, you know. Like a beer. So we'll just do a quick description on how a combine actually harvests corn. So we have our stock of corn with an ear coming off of it. When we come over to here, there's rotating knives that grab the corn stock. As they rotate, they pull the stock down. The stock can't fit between this gap right here, so the ear pops off. The chains here pull the ears to the auger. The auger pulls it to the center of the combine. There's another chain that takes it inside the combine. If we come around the side here. Okay. Once the material actually enters the combine, this, this would be the heart where you see right here, this would be called the rotor. And depending on the crop, this will spin say 350 RPM inside there. And that centrifugal force in there will actually separate the grain from the plant material. So the grain falls through the, the we call them concaves, but falls through the slots there. And the plant material screws out the back of the combine. Then the grain goes through here. We have a giant fan right down here that blows the, the light plant leaf material out. Then the grain falls down to the bottom. And on the other side of the combine, it's pulled up into the tank, into the top. So when the tank's full, this big, auger right here we'll dump it into a truck then so it's pretty simple in theory on how they operate yeah, and then the light plant, plant the, the plant material goes out to yeah the top, right? yep. yep all right well thank you yep no problem you know the price range probably anywhere from 500 to 800 thousand depending on the size yeah. of the options on. yeah I, I guessed a million so you know i, I was, I was a yeah. above so yeah. and then the header 12 world header like that's on there's another probably at least 150 thousand right Yes, yeah, so all together, probably close to. It's rear four wheel drive. Mm -hmm. And how drive, everything four wheel drive. Right. Right. The yeah. engine, that's your engine right above you. I with see it, the, yeah. With all the major belts. It's, yeah, it's never gonna look this clean again once you start using it. <laughs> and back here, that's where it spits out the, the trash. The trash, yeah. And the then, part of the plant that we don't need. And up there, there's a tank right yeah objects in camera are larger than they appear by the way you can have that way but see with the, having a belt this is like bob so it's got a and this is right. a mac don so it's uh it's a, it's a conveyor belt instead of an auger gathering you know? right so it's, again this is tailored to whatever plant you're uh well, wheat soybeans yeah are the main ones yeah, the main combine is the same, just the header that is different. Yep. And there's even other different types of head, headers too. Anyway. Case IH has a gift shop here, of course. Right. Toy tractor. And maybe I could, I should get something like this for Pelican, you know, because, uh, I mean, this does all kinds of things, right? Yeah. It's a lawn mower. And you can load and you can put different heads here like to, to carry uh, like yeah. logs and whatnot yeah. and uh, back here that would get dangerous you'll start digging up everything I mean I don't I don't need I don't need to hire anybody anymore if I if I get one of this yeah. non-stop digging <laughs> simulators here and the future farmers and there's a picture of where we're at yeah right we're there. on the yeah. display area 
that dry that we sprayed last night was this one here. We went back and that's through that, the that, that nature area. Yeah, right that's there. the nature area. And the grain bins, it must not be full touch grain. Oh, yeah. There you go. Uh, oh, no, there's a grain bins. There's their north farm. So Ohio State House owns all this all over here and then this back over here. And then they own all this and this. And then, oh, wrong screen. And then Bill Gates Farm. Oh, that's Bill Gates. Yep, that's Bill Gates mm. Farm. Well, yeah, here we have some pretty cool vintage tractors. That all mechanical. Case IH used to be International Harvester until 1985 when they merged with J.I. Case. And here's the evolution. It's got air conditioner. Perfect for Florida. This is luxury. Do we have a horn here? No, no it's off. <laughs> Let's check it out. This is pretty cool. And this is your three-point hitch. Three-point hitch. One in the back. Loader, gears. And they don't have our... It has air conditioning, but yeah, they don't it say a radio. No radio? No radio yet. It would be up somewhere. Oh, up there. There's where the radio would go. All right. There you go. Otherwise, we can get a Bluetooth speaker, right? Yep. Anyway, this is really cool. Maybe I need a bigger one. And there's your, and here's the, there's your the three hitch. point. Yeah. You get your hits and you got your three point. And these are the hydraulics outlets right. for like if something that would use hydraulics. Yeah, if you got need it. And then. And yeah, they keep going up in size, and up in size, yeah. and up in size. Yeah, up this this might be a little too big for Pelican. There's some. <laughs> there's always a medium. There's always a medium, or that one actually. Now we're talking. Look at that baby <laughs> inside the cockpit. Future farmer right there. And then, or or maybe you just go with the crap. No, that's the one. Oh, that one has the. Track. The yeah, tracks, yeah. Track. yeah. Yeah, maybe this one because but that one would damage my, my driveway. So actually, this is no. the one we need. Actually, this one would damage you. Tires yeah, would damage one? before the tracks. Yeah. It, it turns exactly the same it, way. It, oh, it still turns. Oh, okay, I thought it was like that. It just it, it distributes away a lot more. Right. Okay. So it, it's 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 like you could go across wet ground with this, where this one may not. Dad? So it just flows. The biggest problem is this cost. Because that tire's probably three to four thousand dollars. Yeah, replacing this is six thousand, I'm not sure. And then she has a lot more hydraulics in the back. Yep. Because of all this you equipment go. runs. Yeah. Well, like this one, you can see the tractor with all the hydraulic How about we get something like this? Oh, these people are in it. This one has the cooler too. Does then it? push that middle pedal. Yeah. There we go. It's, it's a it's a push pedal to adjust. Um, what do we have here? Our gears. Yep. Forward. Forward. forward and and uh, this is complicated. All um, sorts of different. It's like a, it's like a Tesla. You know, has a big screen. And uh, got another screen um, up there. Yeah. Your air conditioning. Stereo. This is very cool. And this is this will be brakes and accelerator or both are brakes. That's uh clutch. That'd oh, be the clutch brake. And brake. And then okay. your their orange pedals, your th your throttle, throttle. throttle all right. yeah. yeah. And these are the gears here. Yeah. We're going forward, forward and reverse. Forward the and gears reverse. would probably be you'd probably select gears different and then that will speed it. Oh, okay. it has a, it has a, it has a hair and a and a, yeah, and, a turtle. and a turtle. <laughs> and there would be different buttons for different settings, and you just once you learn them, you just hit a button. And yeah, it's it does. Nice. It takes you where you need to do it. We set up for auto steer. You got to place for your phone. Do, do we have power steering here? I'm sure yep. we do. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah there ain't nothing that wouldn't have power steering. Oh, they should have pricing information. You know, just saying. And this, if, you have, if you have to ask. It's, it costs too much. It costs too much, and it probably does. <laughs> we did ask how much it costs. Ballpark. First take? Yeah. First take, it's an investment. <laughs> <laughs> so if you have to ask, <laughs> you can't afford that, right? The full sticker price is that one sits is probably about 1.3 million. 1.3 million. Wow. 
Oh, yeah. Even got a cable already set up and you get stuck for some reason. I don't know why with a crack you get stuck. Yeah. Because when you have one of these and somebody else gets stuck, they know your phone number. Uh, oh, okay. You, yeah. you can drive into a stuck machine, drop the cable, hook the chain yeah. in, back out. And drag yeah, them. that thing will go out of anything. <laughs> yeah, there's uh, all kinds of attachments. Down on the okay, ground. so it's like a right. It's okay, in transport I see, mode I right I mean. now. I see what I mean. Yep. And this one, and this get, this gives you an example of. Yeah, this is more maybe it's more size tractor for Pelican, but yeah. You, this is a hay mower. I'll show you in the front. But you got a hydraulics for folding, and then you got your PTL for operation, and it's mounted on a three-point hitch. Okay. And that's a pull-type hay mower. Oh, I see. Or they call it a disc binder. This is spinning around majorly fast. These little blades, lawnmower, they actually miniature lawnmower blades, I see. like on your lawnmower. Right. They're spinning. This thing's spinning fast cutting. Now, the cool thing with this is, because it's a quick change blade, if you catch something, rock something, it breaks out of the way. Right. And he'd give you the better yeah. details well, on the RPMs. What are those, the, the, those big tractors for well, like the high well, clearance? First, since we're on the hay equipment, my mowers, you had to rake. They got it out of order. He's a steady friend of mine. Yeah. Round baler. This one will pick up the the hay. You can do straw too, but hay. This is down. This is in the opening unloading position. Right. Now I've never ran a round baler. I've always done square bales. He'll have to tell you how a round baler really works. Yeah. He's the hay and I'm the hay and forge working yeah. manager. Yeah. All right. So the hay comes in. So with this closed, it's gonna come over that bottom roll, these belts are spinning up. It's gonna climb those belts and start turning around and basically just rolls it up into a big circle. Into a big, right, right around the photo there. Oh, there. oh, that's how you make those? Yeah. yeah. Okay, there you go. Now, you should have started there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't see the photo until then. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, okay, I and see this. <laughs> there you go. That's how they make these things. So this is... And this one makes the stackable hay bales we've seen in some states. I'm learning so much here today. Well, I just learned something new. I learned that this triangle means SMV, slow moving vehicle. And uh, I mean, I've seen those and now even some of these, and uh, they told me it's a European thing that they're, they're doing. They have like the, the, the maximum, maximum speed of the vehicle, like this one. Like this one would be 30 miles per hour. So you know, yeah, if you're stuck behind one of these on the on the highway. And uh, Jim just told me this is a sprayer. <laughs> and I'm sure he's gonna tell me how it works here real soon. But while we're at it, we're gonna try to climb up there and see. Better. It did make it's a like, well, well, so what two does different do? yeah. application equipment machines here. So uh, we have a Patriot sprayer, which is kind of a everyday, all day type of sprayer uh, that has a really nice ride. Would go fast, you know, up to right. mm -hmm. uh, road speeds of around 35 miles an hour. That's max. fast. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And, but it has a limit yeah. as far as how high the crop can get. Right. So mm. you're going using it for, you know, burn down of weeds of our small crops right. for putting mm. on nitrogen. Then whenever you get into taller crops, you want you to get your corn one. up and you want to put some sort of fungicide over the top or late season nitrogen, right. you move into something like this Miller Nitro, mm. which uh, has the ability to, to raise and lower up, and down. Uh, oh, up to uh, 73 inch clearance because all those shields are just folded down it would be yeah. right yeah and you could put those booms and go over top of tasseled corn and, and apply that way and both machines feature technology as far as being able to see in between the row or sense the row so it'll steer itself between the rows okay. so. and uh and spray using bursts versus just a steady stream so it will regulate and turn off individual mm -hmm. rows versus uh, sections or the whole machine when you make a yeah. turn into a headland. What cool. size boom is on this? Both have 120 foot booms. 120, 120 foot wide. Right. Uh, to give you an idea, Bob's bean head when you rode in a combine, that's only 40 foot wide. Foot wide so it's his 1200 gallon tanks on both. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, that's good up there. for the drive system and the ride. They both have luxury cabs in them, so. Yeah. Really Price bad. tags. Let's get scary stuff. Well, you're talking on this one around 800000 and this one's about 700000 Let me get up there and see the amenities. Let's see. I think I can do this one-handed. Let's see. Lift up the, the, the seat. Check this out. Oh, look at the tank up here. Actually, it looks pretty cool from up here. Higher perspective. Let's uh, let's see the cockpit here. Oh, panoramic view. And then again, you have your footrests. And your screens all over radio air conditioner now this is cell phone mount <laughs> hey in a different life i may have been a farmer these are really cool i guess this is uh, to tell you but simple means how much you have left When you're putting your chemicals in, you hook up this for your main product, and this is for your rinse water. And you fill it, and there's a touch screen so you can put the cycle on. You want to clean the tank or clean the booms, fill the tank, and you can put your chemicals into this. And it'll mix it and clean out your jug for you. And uh, once you're done, this all folds up tight so there's nothing hanging down below the machine. Uh, and the cool thing about this one is, I don't know if I told you, it's got two sets of cameras on it, or one camera up here oh, in the I center see. section. That's going to steer you through the short rows. So it sees leaves yeah. or it sees ground and it steers. Yeah, it's, and it's, it's got two it's radar sad. sensors down here. So when you're spraying into tall corn and you can't see the ground, right oh, there, it's going to detect okay. the, the stalk and steer it so it doesn't run over the corn as you're spraying. Uh, it is, it's incredible how much technology they're putting on these things. Oh, okay, it's two things. And then, like I said, Robert, that's what he's saying about clearance. Yep. What's a three-point hitch? It this just... A, uh, yeah, point, 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 and then you have your top link, because that's uh, the third point. Mm -hmm. You get a quick attach here. So, instead of putting a pin in, like some of the other equipment, this can lift up and catch everything and uh, release so it's just, uh, it. Are you release it? Yeah, you just, you just do that, yeah. pull the pin. But it, to go in, it would, it's spring-loaded. You just lift yeah, up yeah, and go. Cool. And then here, you got a plan. This is the plan. John Deere had them. You mean you don't, you don't, you don't put the seeds by hand? No, no, <laughs> just kidding. You got oh, and so, this one set up. So that will be full of seeds there? No, the front tanks for for That's liquid liquid and then this here okay. had the seat in it and um and, and the planters really anymore it used to be you always put soybeans and wheat with the drill um any more planters are either set up for corn or beans or some farmers use both okay. just like this this small planter this has got the middle rows or left so Absolutely. when you're doing corn it'd be a six row corn planter Okay. If you drop the middle things, you could use it for, for soybeans, which is a tighter tolerance. Yeah, so right. everything is accessible. Everything, it's... all the way back to the main radiator. That one yeah, just a little so bit harder. It gets, it gets dusty, you can you just... Blow them out. Across the road from Case IH, we have John Deere. I would have liked to stop and see what the differences are, if there are different approaches to doing the same task, who invented what? Who's copying the competition? This, by the way, a huge Fendt combine. Apparently, they come in different classes. And this one happens to be class 8. Great Plains tillage equipment. 
and he has a great planes grill. Are they compatible? Like, can you? Yeah, everything's do a, everything. All the they all use the three point uh, hitch. Yeah, everything's the same. Sometimes the hydraulic tips are different. Beer is okay. different than most. Everybody else is using the uniform. This is seed tender here. This one bought white one, and these are the grain carts like Bob. Just a lot bigger than what Bob had that unloaded combine yeah. unloaded too. Oh. Jim is swerving and out of traffic here. I don't know what's going on. I'm breaking he, rules. He's supposed to be a professional driver, not me. Yeah, I'm breaking rules. <laughs> I think I think next time I'm gonna drive the golf carts. That's it. Here's another huge combine. These are feed mixers for cattle. Woods, they're famous in mowing. Choppers. This is very, very cute for the future farmer in life. In your life, right? <laughs> oh, I can vintage too for two hundred twenty-five. Two hundred and twenty-five dollars. What a bargain! We got our grill from a tractor for sixty-five. Yeah. One hundred forty-nine for the case. Very good. That's heavy. Here we have some vintage Messy Ferguson tractors. The name came after the merger of Messy Harris and the Ferguson Company. So many brands you don't know about unless you are in this business. It is a whole different world. Look at the seats on some of these old units. I think comfort is one of the things that has improved the most over the years. There's an old square baler for you. And this shows you how much loader technology changes. You ain't taking that loader off once it's on there. It's there forever. And it's cable, pole, there's cylinders, but then it stays on. And even here, this is going a little bit more modern. It can be removed, but it's a lot harder. You know, it's it's, it's not like the, not like. These are so well preserved. These tractors from here back are exactly the same. Okay. The only difference is the, the way plans. the front end is made. Okay, I see it. Yep. And but the, the engine transmission rear end is the same. It looks like this. But they did this. They they called it a mid mount. Yeah. They used to mount cultivators there okay. back okay, in the I day see. on the high ones. And this one doesn't. This, this one. one didn't have that. Apparently Ferguson invented the three-point hitch that is used on all and, uh, tractors nowadays. This, this revolutionized uh, tractors from just pulling on the drawbar. These have a peculiar speedometer, same gauge for speed and RPMs. Hmm. RPMs and speed in the same. We could spend all day here looking at old tractors, but right now we're going to the field to see the drones in action, among other things. The drone is up in the air. This one is a Hilio Ag 130. It is programmed to do the exact same routine time after time. I am curious how a drone like this one would do in less than perfect weather. Being heavier, I am sure it can withstand stronger winds and I wonder how long can it fly. So many questions. Well, apparently this one can do up to 50 acres in one hour, autonomously. Drones have really come a long way in the past few years, compared to the original Phantom I owned 10 years ago. Here we also have a model plane. It is flying again, and once again, the exact same routine. 
We are witnessing right here the future of agriculture. All automated. Oh, perhaps it is the present. Let's go to the field, where they are demonstrating other kinds of equipment, like combines, tractors, tillers. There's a Class 9 John Deere combine, which is pretty impressive. But I believe they have a Class 10 somewhere around here. Here they are doing some tilling demos. I didn't even know that was a thing, but I guess not all tillers are created equal. Yes. They call it a toolbar, where all the pieces bolt on. Sometimes these will be bolted together too. This machine will, this owner will change the depth of this by itself. That's one of the larger tractors with the tracks. It is demo time. Now it is time to inspect the job. I have no idea whether this is good or bad, but it's very cool. Yeah, I see a lot of people examining, you know, the, how it looks after the fact, and, uh, and they seem to be pleased. <laughs> There's that class 10 combine we were talking about. It is a huge, beautiful thing. And here we have a robotic sprayer. It is all becoming automated. Okay. I was probably tall, but just different parts. It looks like, like the Hubble like, telescope, but it's, it's not. It's like the inside part of that combine that rode where the rotor thing is. Okay. such a massive expo. By the way, a tradition here since the 1960s, attracting students, farmers, and all kinds of people from all over the state. There's pork sandwiches. Oh, yeah. We got three cheese. Well, Jim, let's eat. Buckeye barbecue, pretty good. There you go, antique farm equipment. This is how it all started. Roland Lipper, who the building is named after, was an Ohio State University agronomist and Hall of Fame recipient. His daughter, Les Malik, who also happens to be Jim's cousin, used to tend the display and she still comes here every year to the Farm Science <laughs> Review. Now that was, is that from your guy, your grandpa's farm too? No, I don't think so. Uh, yeah, that's really cool. Let's see, a lot of this stuff he had collected on his garage wall. You know, they first started this antique collection when the uh, review was still down on the campus and they had one uh, open shed building and they thought 1876, you know, the. Uh, 100th anniversary, anniversary year, 19, 1976, and people were so fond of it. Well, they got these cupboards for the country kitchen, and most of that stuff came out of Grandma and Grandpa Lieber's farm, my oh, grandpa's really? farm. And uh, uh, the, they were remodeling Orton Hall, so a lot of those cupboards were up in wherever the place that the, the, uh, the university furnished, you know, for stuff to be used, be given a new life. And uh, so they got those cupboards, and my jacket says, I earned Review that. Review crew. There you go. I earned that. You're going to pull? <laughs> yeah. pull that. Huh? Liz says it's okay. You can pull, pull it. that. Pull it. Pull it real hard. Pull hard. Pull hard. Look, we got to go like this, like the air one. We got our 1899 manure spreader. Yep. This is a couple years old. Just a couple. I have a corn husker. Well, what is this? Uh, I've got one like this. That's a corn husker? Corn husker. You, we took an ear corn in there and you spin it around, it would 
to see the teeth and that, it would take the corn right off the husk. I find it very fitting to go from the ultra-modern, even futuristic a few minutes ago, to the antiques. Because why not? It is actually very cool to see how the previous generations did it and how much things have advanced and changed over the years. I am very glad they have preserved all this unique antique equipment for the generations to come. Is that a picture of your dad in the background in that photo? Yeah. Let's look at JCB tractors. <laughs> Let's check it out. And here we are, this one looks easy to drive. We got our two pedals. I like this one too, you see? That's a... That's a track. What about, you like this one or the red one? We should take a look at the green one. Just for good measure. Jim is not having it. I don't think he likes John Deere. Hmm. We may never find out. Here we have more antiques. what? Uh, 1890, probably in use until the 1940s, milk wagon. Uh, here, 1923 Model T. Also milk wagon, you see the milk jugs up there. And this is a 1930 Chevrolet, Starship's ancestor. And uh, look how easy it would be to work on this uh, engine. Everything is right there. It's a fuel truck, corn planner, and the big contraption. It's a um, Persian unit. Ah! They still use it. An America standard truck from 1918. Look at that engine. It's a strange looking engine right there. And now we've got tractors. Look at John Deere. And a McCormick Deering Pharma, several of them. A thresher is a machine that separates grain seed from the stalks and husks by beating the plant to make the seeds fall out. He still makes mowers too. Woo, woo. For Pelican, perfect. And a nice old Mack truck here. That from, the, actually, from the 40s probably? 1951. Oh, 51. Plus and that is actually, was used in the farm here. It hasn't changed a lot, that would be more efficient. And then the, see, this will rotate to where the drop poles are, right. and you can change it a little bit different. I mean, things are more efficient, but the basic, the basic concept is the same. Regular tractor, but it's got a mounted picker. So okay. this, this would pick corn like a combine would. Other than this leaves, the corn, the corn actually stays on the ear. So the, oh, husk, the, the debris stays here, but then the corn drops in and goes in the wagon for where the corn's still in the cob. 
Now this machine here, it takes small bales and turns it into a big bale. It's a big bale. So you can do a small bale, gathers it up, and if you look behind there, they kind of show you. It, behind there, it's, it's cubed up. And here we've got a milking machine. What do you think, Ryder? Are they milking? Yeah. Cow doesn't look too happy though, so I don't know. A little vector. This in front of us is the vector. It's an automatic TMR mixer, so it goes up and down the barn on like whatever you schedule it to do. Uh, it's got mm -hmm. a laser that'll read the feed height, and it'll okay. be pushing the feed height or feed back up to the fence where the cows are. And then if that feed height gets too low, it goes back to its uh, kitchen, and then it'll make a new batch of feed, and it'll go back out and mm -hmm. feed the cows. Okay, I see. That over there is just another feed pusher. All that does is push the feed up. It doesn't feed the mm -hmm. cows at all. It just pushes yeah, it up, so pushes the cows always have feed in front of them. Because cows like <laughs> to take the feed away from them. Yeah, yeah, they like to sort through it. This is just a manure collector, so manure it drives collector. through the barn and on its own collects all the manure and then goes back to a dump station and dumps it wow. so you don't have to have a skid loader in there you don't have alley scrapers and it does it by itself yep. it's, yeah it's, it's like a, it's, it's like a it's Roomba like, for a barn like a room oh my that's that's <laughs> awesome like a Roomba for a barn barn yeah that's that's uh, so it's all on its own cow walks in on their own it milks right. them on their own and it just doesn't take any people involved at all 24 hours a day, seven days a week, it's running. All this stuff is automated, incredible. Okay, so this is the color. This is the infrared color they put on the cow. It's not other straight. You gotta go straight. We are, we are in Journey's hands here. <laughs> All right, now we're gonna make a left. You have to turn that way. Very good. Now bring it back the other way. Bring it back. How to rescue people from grain from either being stuck in a grain bin or being a thing because and that's what the whole thing the pressure of the grain like if a person goes so far that's the ditching machine the tile would drop in the back that whole thing spinning and the shovels are spinning and it drops the dirt on the thing and puts it to the side. It's a rotating thing where I guess if you're gonna work on the animal on the side, you can rotate it. So, fencing and feeding male, male feeders. There is so much to see, it is overwhelming. Especially for me. I mean, as you can imagine, everything is pretty much new. This is a grain dryer, I hear. And there's like big turbo jets on there. You gotta understand that the walls on each side is not even probably that much where the corn's falling down. Because yeah. corn comes out so wet it can't be stored. It has to be put down in a drain and then <coughs> there. Too much information to absorb in one day. But I'm getting the concept. At least now we know a little bit. And really, that's all we can expect from this crash course in agricultural equipment. People think it's cruel, but actually it's for keeps the animal from getting hurt and keeps the person yeah, from getting hurt. Sorry for the mix. Yeah, that's, uh, it goes up into the silage thing, picks up the silage, and puts it in a mixer. Like the company that enters an education sees under a high drug. drugs, yeah. Okay. Who wouldn't want to buy a llama? Or, wait a minute, aren't those alpacas? So yeah, they even have livestock here at the Farm Science Review. That's it. I'm exhausted. There is only so much my brain can absorb in a day. And we've barely scratched the surface here. 
I have enjoyed this tremendously and learned so much. And I hope you have enjoyed it too. As you've seen, there's a lot more than meets the eye when it comes to the agriculture industry. And surprisingly, it is a lot more high-tech than I was expecting. In the morning, we say our goodbyes and continue our journey. I want to thank Jim, Barb, Gabby, Ryan, Journey, Ryder, Liz, of course, for her charm and knowledge, all the reps at the show who so graciously explained how everything worked, and Nick for inviting us to this eye-opening experience. Next, we're going to a museum I've been hearing about for many, many years. And needless to say, it is massive. This is one of those that would take more than one day if you really want to see everything. And one of those you must visit in person for that matter. But I'll try and do my best here to show you the highlights in just a couple of hours. I mean, this is the definitive museum if you want to see airplanes. And it is completely free. There is plenty of parking so we can do it with trailer in tow. As we walk towards the museum, this on our right is Memorial Park. Here's a memorial to the United States and Allied personnel who flew the Himalayas in the China-Burma-India theater in World War II. Here in the museum there are four huge hangars housing several galleries and we're going to begin with the Early Years Gallery. We begin with this timeline of the early history of flight, beginning with hot air balloons in 1783 to heavier than air flight in 1903. Here's the Chanute 1904 glider. Jumping to 1916, here we have the Fiat A12 six cylinder engine. And I apologize for the lower video quality here, but this museum is kept pretty dark. And this is a wind tunnel from 1901. Here's a piece of fabric from the original Wright 1903 flyer. The original aircraft is of course on display at the Smithsonian in Washington. This, by the way, is the 1909 military flyer. Very cool to see these machines from the very early days of aviation and military flight. Then of course came the World War I era, and airplanes were actually constructed like this, using wood frames and metal fittings. Here's a rotary engine, first appearing in 1909. The aerial torpedo from 1917, invented here in Dayton, it was never used in war. Here's the Caproni C836, an Italian heavy bomber, very rare. Only 153 of them were delivered between 1923 and 1927. Here's the Martin MB-2, the first US-designed bomber produced in large numbers, first ordered in June of 1920. I could really go through every single one of these, and believe me, I'm tempted. But then this would be a very, very long video. You're gonna have to come here to the museum one of these days. Here we have the inner war years, before we move to the World War II gallery. We go from Nazi concentration camps to a map of the Japanese objectives as of December 1941. Let's step into the World War II gallery. Sadly, the deadliest war the world has ever seen at least in recorded history. And airplanes for the first time played a major role. Here's a Curtis P-40E Warhawk, widely used at the beginning of the war. Here we have a B-25 bomber, one of America's most famous airplanes of World War II. B-29 
B-24D Liberator, another famous bomber. Very cool to see all these airplanes up close. That, by the way, looks very uncomfortable. So many airplanes, and we're just getting started. We still have Southeast Asia, Korea, the Cold War, which is the one actually I'm more interested in since I was alive at the time, and then the space and presidential galleries. This is definitely one of those you need at least a whole day, probably two, to be able to assimilate everything. Here we have some German weaponry and aircraft as well. The small one is a 163B Comet, which had a rocket engine way ahead of its time. And here's the ME-262 Schwalb, the world's first operational turbojet aircraft. The R-4 up there was the world's first production helicopter. And here's the Boeing B-29 Super Fortress that dropped the Fat Man atomic bomb over Nagasaki on August 9, 1945. Here we can see the evolution of clothing in the Air Force. We continue to the Korea and Vietnam Wars. Here's a Douglas C-124 heavy lift cargo aircraft. Let's go into the belly of the beast. Mainly used during the Korean War, it could lift up to 34 tons. Hmm, interesting. Let's step inside the only B-29 bomber to become a jet ace. To become an ace, a pilot must score five aerial kills, and this one killed five Soviet MiG-15s during the Korean War. This one looks really cool, the B-45C Tornado. We're definitely in the jet engine era now. Now, this is different, a North American F-82G twin Mustang, famous for its very long range. It broke records, in fact. Here's a Soviet MiG-15 fighter. This one flown by a North Korean defector into South Korea in 1953. And here's the American counterpart, the F-86A Sabre. And here we have the emergence of stealth technology. The F-22 Raptor was the first stealthy air dominance fighter released in 1997. It combined stealth, maneuverability, and the ability to fly long distances at supersonic speeds. Now onto the Cold War Gallery, where we are greeted by a giant B-52 Stratofortress. If you've ever seen one of these up in the air, you know it is a sight to behold. An F-105G. The B-52 is so large that we have to see it in parts. I thought I was going to enjoy this part of the museum a lot more. And I am, don't get me wrong, but to be honest, we're getting tired. There are so many airplanes. I think this museum is best enjoyed in sections. Just come one day and just do the Cold War and do another section a different time. It is free after all, so you can come as many times as you want. Here we have some laser-guided bombs.
It is like everywhere you look, you know, it is almost too much. Here we have a Soviet MiG-21. This one was made to replace the MiG-15 of the Korean War era. The MiG-17. Very cool to be able to get so close and get a glimpse inside the airplane. This Sikorsky HH-3E was nicknamed Jolly Green Giant. Here's a UH-1P from the Vietnam War. We continue walking around the Cold War gallery, the gigantic B-52 ever-present in the background. Here's a sneak peek at the B-52 cockpit. I'm pretty sure the ones still in use may have updated electronics. Yeah, gotta have coffee, right? If you're flying the B-52. This is fascinating. Wondering what it would be like flying something like this. Here we have more Cold War history, like the Berlin airlift, which lasted over a year after the Soviet Union blockaded all land supply routes to West Berlin. One of the saddest events of the Cold War actually may have been the construction of the Berlin Wall, built by East Germany to prevent mass migration to the West. As a result, families got separated overnight, the city divided. Two different worlds separated by the so-called Iron Curtain for decades. Guess what? We still have a whole other half of the Cold War gallery to see. Here we have a Convair B-36J Peacemaker, a strategic bomber predecessor to the B-52. The Convair had six main engines and four smaller ones for additional bursts of speed. Take a look at the wingspan on this thing. Let's see what this is. Hmm, an XF-90 prototype. This one was used to test the effects of a nuclear explosion while the aircraft was parked. This one is a Boeing WB-50D Super Fortress. Okay, this is really cool to see. The inside of a fighter jet, packed with technology. Air conditioner, even a 250 volt inverter. Ooh, breathing oxygen. Yeah, very cool. It is an F-86 Sabre. Here's the legendary SR-71 Blackbeard. It was in service from 1964 to 1990. And during that time, it was the fastest and highest flying operational aircraft in the world. And here's the legendary F-16. No Cold War exhibit can be complete without talking about the Berlin Wall, which I talked about it briefly earlier. The wall finally came down in 1989 after the collapse of the Eastern Europe communist governments. Here, a car, built in East Germany. Yeah, they weren't that great. Here we have more Russian aircrafts, this one being the MiG-29. And here's an F-15. You see what I'm saying? It keeps going and going. It is almost too many airplanes and helicopters, weapons, artifacts, you name it. Oh, here is the very high-tech temper tent. Here's a Northrop B-2 Spirit test aircraft, built without the engines or the instruments. The B-2 Spirit had the high aerodynamic efficiency of a flying wing design with composite materials, special coatings and the classified stealth technology. 
As a result, the B-2 became virtually invisible to even the most sophisticated air defense radar systems. Now entering the missile gallery. Coming up next, the presidential gallery and the space gallery. Here they have a space shuttle exhibit, which is actually NASA's first crew compartment trainer. Even though the outside doesn't look all that authentic, the interior should be. Here's a previously classified early warning satellite here in what would have been the cargo bay. in the cargo bay. Now what is this? These are very futuristic looking drones. Unmanned aircraft. Let's go look for the presidential gallery. Satellite catcher. Here is the very unique XC-142A, built in the 1960s. It was both a chopper and an airplane. This particular design never went into production. In fact, this is the only one left. But eventually other aircraft like the V-22 Osprey took advantage of this technology. I see what looks like an Air Force One over there, so we must be getting close to the presidential gallery. This in front of us happens to be the first aircraft purposely built to fly the President of the United States, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, a Douglas VC-54C Skymaster. Here they have a gate to make sure you can fit because it is kind of narrow in there. The airplane was officially named the Flying White House, although it soon became known for its moniker, the Sacred Cow, because of all the security around it. Let's step inside. This is going to be so cool. It's like stepping back in time. Here we have the cockpit. Now I feel like I'm doing an RV tour. Here's the galley with two burners, a sink, and even a refrigerator. On the other side, we have bunk beds. By the way, a refrigerator on a plane was very rare at the time. Moving right along, here we have some storage for luggage and other things. Could this be pantry storage? Here's a four-person dinette. On the other side, two sofas, a telephone, and a bunk overhead. Here we have some closet space. This would have been the executive conference room, with a private lavatory, and there's a Morphe bed behind the sofa. Let's walk around and see it from the other side. Here's more seating and what looks like another lavatory way in the back. Next we have the Douglas VC-118, called the Independence, built for Harry Truman, the 33rd president, who took over the executive office after FDR's untimely death. This was the second aircraft built specifically to transport the President of the United States. And it is, basically, a military version of the DC-6 commercial airliner. Let's step inside the Independence, named after the town in Missouri where Truman grew up. As we step inside, it looks like there is a lot more technology here. This one had reversible pitch propellers, weather radar, a radar altimeter, autopilot, and here we have the cockpit.
going towards the back. Check it out! That reckoning computer used as an aid to navigation. Computer! We're talking here late 40s, early 50s. Here we have some more technology on the other side. Let's keep on walking towards the back. Here we have a small sitting area for four. And more sitting areas here. Pantry storage, perhaps. Here is the very nice galley with four burners, oven, sink, refrigerator. The conference room doesn't seem to be as nice as FDR's, but it did say somewhere that items have been removed for conservation. Way in the back we have a private lavatory. There was another lavatory towards the middle of the aircraft that I missed. I missed that. Next, we have the Lockheed VC 121E Columbine 3. Eisenhower's airplane from 1954 until he left office in January of 1961. It is a military version of the famous Lockheed L 1049 Super Constellation commercial airliner. Welcome to the 1950s. Here we have a little more technology here towards the front of the aircraft. Radar, perhaps? And here's the cockpit. Lots of gauges in this one. Here's the radio station. Now let's walk towards the back. Eisenhower named this aircraft, which happened to be his third constellation, Columbine 3, after the official state flower of Colorado, in honor of his wife Mammy. Still, none of these can match the comfort of a white body like the current Air Force One, but I'm sure at the time this was luxury. Is that a Berkeley water filter I see? Hmm, probably not. Very nice, the galley here. They keep getting bigger and bigger. Here's the head, the lavatory. Check it out, movie projector! Yeah, television as we know it was still in its infancy at the time. Here in the back we have Mr. and Mrs. Eisenhower's lavatory. Very nice, actually. I wonder what size are the holding tanks. Now finally things start to look familiar. This is of course the first jet aircraft built specifically for the president. Kennedy's airplane. It is a Boeing VC-137C, basically a highly modified 707-320B. Besides Kennedy, Sam 26000 here carried seven more presidents. Johnson, Nixon, Ford, Carter, Reagan, George H.W. Bush, and Clinton. Touchstone telephone, things are getting modern. And uh, since this one wasn't used until 1990, I imagine they have updated it over the years. This one looks a lot more high-tech in an 80s sci-fi movie kind of way. 
The galley, however, seems smaller. There may be another one towards the back. This is a much larger aircraft. Nice conference room. And here's another conference room. That's the way to fly right there. It's a little bit narrow here. Now, this is the staff. Yeah. Look at Yep. The Late 80s technology all around. Now you know why they uh, put that. These look pretty comfy. And yeah, there's a larger galley here towards the back. It is a little crowded in here, by the way. Seems to be a popular plane. And those are the lavatories. Oh, another galley. This Gulfstream carried senior American leaders like ex-presidents, presidential spouses, secretaries of state and defense, foreign dignitaries, and many high-ranking civilian officials and military personnel. Finally, we have the Space Gallery. I wonder how GPS works. I think GPS is one of those technologies that has had the most impact in our daily lives. Here we have several spacecraft and spacesuits. Mercury spacesuit, Apollo spacesuit, this is really cool. Solid rocket boosters, huh? Like on the space shuttle. Check it out. Space Force. Whoever designed that logo has got to be a Star Trek fan. And there's the pen that Donald Trump used to sign the Space Force Act, thus creating this new branch of the US Armed Forces. Here's actually a KH-9 reconnaissance satellite. These were in use from 1971 to 1986 and they actually shot film, which then was sent back to Earth. Here we have a Gemini B spacecraft part of a top-secret program to take photos of Cold War adversaries like the Soviet Union and China. And here is a Mercury spacecraft, and it is really cool to see what's under the hood, if you will. This was America's first spacecraft to take astronauts into orbit. Very tight quarters in there, but we had to start somewhere, right? Now we're going even earlier to the late 1950s, to the balloon gondolas. I didn't even know this existed. They were used to study the effects of high altitude on humans. How about parachuting from the edge of space? Yeah, they did that too. I think we've had enough fun for one day. Oh, check it out! A Canadian flying saucer. We're retracing our steps, looking for the exit. What a great museum! We are exhausted and overwhelmed at everything we've seen. But there is another place here in the area we want to visit. I'm glad there are not too many people so that we can park with the trailer in tow. Of course, we couldn't leave a Dayton, Ohio without first paying a visit to the Wrights brothers, of course. Check it out. 
Yeah, this is the Wright Brothers, the Wright Brothers Memorial. Eh, let me walk this way because I think there's a view here. There's like a, like a terrace with a view. And um, there's a small museum back there that I was tempted, but after after seeing the, the Air Force Museum, you know, it's um, we kind of uh, museumed out at this point. Tomorrow we may visit another cool museum. But I mean, we, we've seen this, I mean, we all know the story of the Wright brothers for the most part. And uh, this around here may have been the world's first airport. Well, the Hoffman Prairie flying field is considered the world's first airport and I don't know if we can see it from here I don't, I don't know if we're gonna be able to to, uh, to drive over there with the trailer in tow because I don't think there's a turnaround but it's somewhere over there near the Air Force Base look at that there's something mesmerizing about seeing a large airplane land from afar Super cool to see that air, that aircraft land on the at the, at the, uh, at the Air Force Base. Okay, apparently what, what the sign says after their success at Kitty Hawk, they came back here to Dayton, Ohio, and uh, they basically cr created what would be the the world's first airport, and that, that's where they really perfected, you know, controlling the aircraft. Um, I'm gonna try and see. I'm gonna look on satellite view, see if there's a turnaround down there, so we can see it. Otherwise. We're heading north. I thought it was that down there, but that's that's just a dam. <laughs> it's a beautiful day here. It's a little warm in Dayton, Ohio. We couldn't quite find our way to Huffman Prairie. I think you have to go into the Air Force Base first. But anyway, we're going to continue north towards a town called Wapakoneda. Yep. This is where we're staying at the Wapakoneda KOA Holiday. A little bit of a splurge, but that's how we do it. We really want full hookups tonight. <sighs> well, as you can see, full hookups, baby. <laughs> and uh, let me tell you, the idea tonight, the idea for today was to to stay at a Walmart or you know some some boondocking, but then again we're running short of water. Our gray is at two thirds, and uh, when we got out of the of the museum there, of the of the Air Force Museum, I made an executive decision and decided instead of boondocking and then staying one night halfway between here and Michigan, how about? We get something nice. We haven't stayed at like a, like, a, like, a, like a resort site in a while, so we splurged. We got a patio site here at this place for two nights. And tomorrow we're gonna go, uh, by the way, this is Neil Armstrong's birthplace. Birth, birthplace. So um, I think they have a museum or something. So we're gonna, we're gonna explore that. So tonight we're just gonna relax. Maybe I'll get some work done, but we're gonna just gonna relax. We got a fire going. And maybe tomorrow we'll do even some, some grilling. It's because that's how we do it. <laughs> Alright. See you tomorrow. We're really hungry, so I left the cameras in the car where we're doing some fish and stir fry. Here's the final product.
morning, we still have some Georgia sausages. Oh yeah. Yum. Let's dig in. Let's go for a little ride to this roadside attraction right here. Well, here we are. This is one of those must-visit uh, roadside attractions here in Wapakoneta, Ohio. This is called First on the Moon, and it's a mural here on the side of the road. Unfortunately, there's no like easy way to park here, so I'm kind of you know, illegally parked there on the side of the road, but I mean, I had to stop and check it out. Of course, this is the birthplace of Neil Armstrong, the first man on the moon. It is a mural by John Cerny. Here. Now let's go to the museum. Well, here we are at the Armstrong Space and Air Museum, or Air and Space Museum, but rather. Um, let's check out this plane real quick here, and I think they have like the lunar lander over there. Pretty cool airplane here. Oh. Let's go see the lunar lander, I mean, the command module, rather. And here we have a representation of the solar system, Sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, you know, you, you know the rest. That's what I want to see. That solar system, by the way, not up to scale. Unlike the one we saw in, in Anchorage, that was up to scale. Here we go, this is the command module mock-up. It is not the, not the real thing. Lander astronauts on the moon. And more importantly, return them to Earth. And this would be the Gemini spacecraft mock-up. Gemini, because it had two astronauts. I have a feeling the real thing had a lot more buttons, but... Yes, there's uh, those tight quarters in here, for sure. You really like, like, have to like each other. Let's, let's put it that way. All right, let's go inside the museum. And here we have a statue of Neil Armstrong. Young Neil Armstrong with an airplane in his hand. Here we have a statue of Neil Armstrong as a test pilot, perhaps. Hello, astronauts. Jim, John Glenn. James Lovell, too. That's a lot of Buckeyes in space. Here we have a timeline of achievements in flight and in space. Young Neil Armstrong memorabilia. They even have the yearbook. Here then, on the record, the man who must be the proudest father in the country, if not the world. Sputnik, that's what really started the space race. And here's Armstrong's Gemini 8 spacesuit. Here's the Gemini 8 spacecraft. For it being a relatively small museum, they do have a lot of artifacts and information about the space race of the 1960s. Yeah, it might take another space race for us to get back to the moon.
And here we have a moon rock. That's the Mars rover, one of them. And here's the statue of Neil Armstrong in his spacesuit. I saw them using this in Apollo 13, the movie. simulator is out of order. Well, I have really enjoyed this museum. They have a space shuttle simulator. Let's see if I can land this thing. Here we have some Russian artifacts as well. They drank Pepsi Cola. Exit through the gift shop. All right, that was a nice museum. Actually, I enjoyed the movie. You know, we've we've all, uh, you know heard the, the story of how they landed on the moon and all that, but sometimes it is nice to hear it again. I don't think we're going to do anything else here, but uh, if we do, you'll be the first to know. Actually, let's check out the Learjet 28 Longhorn. It was first manufactured in 1977. Only five of them made, according to the interpretive sign. In 1979, Neil Armstrong set five world records while flying his Learjet 28. All right, now for real, let's go. It is early fall, and some of the leaves are starting to turn here in Michigan. Here we are arriving at Lake of Dreams Campground in Merrill, Michigan. One of those with perhaps too many rules for my taste, but it is what it is. 
Everybody seems to be here already. There's Lance boom talking with Boomer at our site. And there is no way I can back it in with the honey wagon there. So I'm gonna try and pull through from the other side since there's no one there. But the people from the campground said it was not allowed. Some places really don't make you feel welcome. But tell you what, I'm not here for the campground. I'm here for the people in it. Fellow travelers, content creators. And we're gonna have a great time together. Honey wagon, that's gotta be a crappy job anyways. And here we are at the M23 meetup here in Michigan. Um, and I believe they have happy hour at this time. So let's check it out. As you know, um, you may not know, but cruising with the Colmans, they have a thing called cocktails with the Colmans. And um, right now, here at the Colmans place, we have cocktails with the Colmans. So let's see what they have. I In like another them. episode of Cocktails with the Colmans. <laughs> Illy, Illy already got her, so I don't want to fall behind, you know? I mean, I feel like you need to keep up. The music is much more entertaining the more you keep up. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is the old fashioned. Apple cider. Very good. Everybody seems to be having such a great time. And we're about to have music. I have to be very careful how much music I can show you here because copyright, you know. And there's going to be a lot of music throughout the weekend. In fact, we have karaoke later today. Some people say that there's a woman to blame. Now I'll actually tune the guitar. So. <laughs> well, good homage to all the parrot heads out there and to Jimmy Buffett. Of course, Lance waiting for for his. No. No, I don't drink. Oh, you don't drink. Good. No, 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 no. That's great. More, more for us. I told you, Lance, I can do these non-alcoholic. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Cheers. Cheers. Start. Can I restart? I screwed it up already. And that's not a problem. It's not a problem. Thank you very much. All the girls I've loved before. Woo -hoo! And the I know as I mentioned, as much as I would like to show you all this, well, actually, I might make a different video just with the music. Writing in my RV, wherever I want to be. Cause I'm free in my RV, yeah, I'm riding, riding in my RV, wherever I want to be. Cause I'm free in my RV. There you go. Do yours, do yours. It's a beautiful morning and I believe we're having pancake breakfast somewhere. Fall is in the air in Michigan. Now for a tradition called the puddle jump. Some folks are going to jump in the lake. Over there they're doing the puddle jump. Alright. Well, this is what they call the puddle jump and I'm not doing it. 
I did not bring my bathing suit. What can I do? She did not sing. Yeah. <laughs> We also have a raffle! 1989, that was a good year. All this, by the way, organized by Kevin, Betsy and Piper of Where Are We Staying? Here. Of course, it wouldn't be an RVers rally without having a potluck. You gotta eat, right? Well, you know, everybody having a good time at the potluck here. And uh, let's see what we can, if I can get something to eat. Everything looks so good. And here we have the desserts. And here we have the salads, veggies, and all that. And Sonia borrowed my camera. Now this is content. Hi, Robert. At night, it is party at the campground! There is also a great campfire. Some new version of Spend the Bottle, perhaps? Everybody's having such a great time. Music, by the way, provided by Sonia, the RV DJ. This is such a great group of joyous, positive people. And that's it for the M23 meetup. M24 will happen September 19th to 22nd, 2024. We're leaving pretty early on this Sunday morning, and our first stop is going to be the dump station because the plan is to stay at a harvest host tonight. We've made a reservation online, and even though they haven't responded yet, we hope they will before we arrive. Otherwise, we'll call. We don't really have a very long drive today to Warner Vineyards in Papa, about two and a half hours. Not the most scenic drive through central Michigan, but it is such a beautiful day and such pristine countryside. Eventually, we make it to our exit, Papa, Michigan. And we call the harvest host because they never responded either approving or denying our stay. Some of them are like that. And when we call, the person who answered the phone said, sure, come in, come hungry, uh, which we are actually. And here we are, but I don't see anywhere to park. So we called again, 
and apparently they're having a special event, so the parking lot is gonna be full, and whoever answered the phone earlier didn't know what they were talking about. It is not the first time this happens, and today we don't really have a plan B, so let's park at the nearby Walmart and regroup. Well, it turns out we're only an hour away from Elkhart, so we're just gonna continue. And I'm sure we'll find somewhere to stay at the RV capital of the USA. We are now in Indiana, and Elkhart, and there's an RV park here on the right with my name on it, but first, we're famished, and I've never been to Texas Roadhouse, which was actually founded in Clarksville, Indiana, so let's eat. I forgot to film in there, by the way, believe it or not, this was my first time at Texas Roadhouse, and let me tell you, this is my new favorite place. Oh, that was so good. Anyway, um, now, by, by the way, I believe it is an Indiana company, originally. Um, there's Minitini. We're going to find somewhere to, to spend the night here at the RV capital of the world. Well, as we were driving into the Texas Roadhouse, we saw on the right-hand side, this RV park seems to be brand new, part of the, the Garden Inn over there. Maybe a little steep at $56 for the night. And their credit card machine was broken, so they were only accepting cash. I'm glad I had cash on me. But I mean, you're smack in the middle of downtown Elkhart, a bunch of restaurants, walking distance. So, you know, it's, it's a good location. And um, changing the subject, I am one disappointment away from canceling my Harvest Host account. Lately, it's been nothing but failures. Anyway, we're not going to do much. I think we're just going to spend the rest of the day working, at least me. And, and, um, and this is the thing. In, in, on Wednesday, we're taking Minitini 4 to the mothership so they can, you know, get some repairs done on certain things. And, um, and then, you know, since we're going to be homeless for a couple of hours, we might explore El Elkhart a little bit, but not today. See you tomorrow. Of course, the main reason I came here was for the open house and to show you some new Winnebago units, but you already saw that. And if you didn't, I'll put a link somewhere. Well, good morning from the RV capital of the world. I was gonna say it's a beautiful morning, but it really isn't. It is kind of cloudy and gloomy, but uh, we're gonna start our morning here at Rice and Roll Bakery. Famous for the donuts. Yeah, donuts make me happy. Mm. And the roll with sausage gravy. I'm sure the roll is down there somewhere. The RV and MH Museum is a must visit place here in Elkhart. If you are an RV enthusiast like we are, there's no other place in Elkhart like the RV and Motorhome Museum. The Hall of Fame, if you will. It's We've been here before, but it's been a while. All right, everybody, come on in. We're getting ready to go on a covered wagon expedition. I must say we're visiting at a bad time of the year. Since it is open house week, most of the areas that would normally be allocated to the museum, they're using them for open house. But anyway, here's a 1929 covered wagon. It was the first production travel trailer. This is very, very cool, and I like the presentation a lot. Next, we have a 1934 Schultz house trailer, manufactured here in Elkhart. This one is starting to look a little more to what we're used to nowadays. Now we have a much larger one, a 1955 Spartan Imperial Mansion. Odd to see the words Spartan and Imperial in the same sentence. It definitely looks like 1955 in here. Yeah. 
residential fridge, residential oven, bunk beds, Ooh. telephone, bathtub, porcelain toilet, and the bedroom. This is very cool. The MH in the name of the museum, oddly enough, actually stands for Manufactured Housing. You would think motorhome or mobile home would be more appropriate, but no, it is manufactured housing, and that's actually the section we're in right now. So I can see why it stands for manufactured housing. This one looks and smells like the 1980s, and we even have a double cassette boombox to prove it. I used to have one of those. Here we have a small bedroom for a child, perhaps. Nice bathroom. And here's the main bedroom. Here we have another one, perhaps from the 1990s. Very nice bedroom with a desk, half bath. I also used to have a similar record player. Here's the bedroom. Here we have a snowmobile, built in Elkhart as well. This is the kind of cottage you might find at a current RV resort, very modern. Which is not what we came here, we want to see the old stuff, so let's continue. Since it is open house, they have moved all the vintage RVs to a smaller warehouse, not their usual display area, so this is not going to be the best experience, I don't think. Still super cool to see. This trailer here is the oldest in the world, a 1913 Earl travel trailer. It was towed by a Model T. Simple, but effective. Definitely a step up from a tent, which was probably the whole purpose at the time. And here we have a 1916 telescopic apartment, an early slide out, if you will. It even had a shower heated by the radiator. Now that's what I call innovation. And here we have a 1931 model AA Ford house car. Not many safety features at the time, I see. And unfortunately, in this setting, some of these RVs are pretty dark inside. An early 1916 cozy tent camper. And here's a 1928 Pierce Aero house car. Yeah, they're still called house cars at this point. I wonder when the term motorhome was adopted. Here's the 1931 house car belonging to actress Mae West, more like an oversized limo. And here's one of less than 50 remaining Baulus Road Chiefs built by the famous sailplane builder and the precursor to the modern Airstream. I wish we could walk inside some of this. A 1922 Zegelmeyer camp trailer. These tents on wheels are getting better with more hard surfaces and all that. And let's see this other motorhome here. Some of these look like a precursor to the schoolie. Got a bus and build it inside. Ooh, there's even a toilet. Now we're talking. Looking through the window, there's a dinette, but I don't see a sign with the year and model, but I'm going to guess early 40s. What do you guys think? A 1936 road home coach. It is a little bit dark inside, but I see a toilet, which looks kind of modern. Definitely not 1930s. I can't barely see it, but overall, not a bad layout. This almost looks like an old Citroën, but it is a house car from 1937, belonging to filmmaker Roy Hunt, cinematographer and producer. It is very unique, 
I guess these vehicles would be perfect to go on location and still have some amenities. Kind of like the way they do it nowadays, but I'm sure the new ones are much more luxurious. Here's a homemade trailer camper. And these usually have lights on when they are in the regular display area. That's why I'm so bummed out we came during open house. I will share a link somewhere to our 2016 video. Fortunately, because of the open house, this seems to be like more like a temporary exhibition. I don't know if they have all of the units that they normally have on display, but... 1954 Holiday Rambler. This is one manufacturer that's still around. I guess the closer we get to present day, the more familiar things will look. Not bad. We have a closet. Still, none of this will have a bathroom. The Elkhart Open House, by the way, is this dealer's only RV show, where manufacturers show their prototypes and newest models, so the dealers know what to purchase the following year, so that's why we are in the dark. Here we have a 1958 22-foot Airstream, actually very similar to the current iconic aluminum construction. Gas heater, refrigerator, stove, pressurized water, all the bells and whistles. And here's a tiny one called the Little Prince. In 1964, Clark Cortez was the first front-wheel drive motorhome. And here's a timeless classic, when Winnebago built the first affordable motorhome. 1969 chassis mounted truck camper, which eventually became the now common Class C motorhome. Let's take a look inside. What they did, basically, they removed the bed of the truck and built a house right on the chassis, like Class C. And here's a road trek, which coincidentally is celebrating 50 years as of 2024. They are responsible for popularizing the camper van. The 1978 Coachman Leprechaun. Ooh, look at those windows. Here's the Star Trek 2. Built out of a 1976 Cadillac Eldorado with an Oldsmobile Tornado engine. Here's the body of an old GMC motorhome, but all modernized inside. I really love these GMCs. It's so dark. Let me see if my phone can do a better job. Let's take a look at the original, the OG 1974 GMC motorhome. These were way ahead of their time. Produced from 1973 to 1978, front wheel drive, air suspension. I kind of wish car companies still built motorhomes. Huge panoramic windows, sofa, dinette, the doghouse to access the engine. And is that an 8-track I see? Back it is a little dark, but there's the fridge and the galley. This area here in the back, I suppose, would turn into a bed. Oh, here's the wet bath. No wonder they're keeping it dark. I don't think this one is restored at all. This may be the most famous schoolie of them all. This is the Bluebird, Mark and Trish, and Caleb of Keep Your Daydream took on Route 66 a few years ago. It is very dark in here, so let me grab my phone. I'm surprised how original they kept it. I mean, I would have been tempted to rip the carpet off and change some of the decor, but then again, it would have never ended up at the RV Hall of Fame. They did add a pretty large battery bank and inverters. You know, some of the high-tech stuff we need. Nope, no lights. Check out the breaker box. It almost looks residential. And 
what is this? Oh, just another closet. Let's check out the galley. Look at that panel, original. I love looking at vintage stuff like this. I mean, mostly original, not all of it. But it is a good compromise, modernizing the essentials, but keeping the old look, especially if it works. And I think we're gonna end it here. What is this? A NASA SpaceX exhibit? Could it be part of Open House? Let's see. I mean, the amount of RVers who have been using Starlink lately is staggering. I would venture to say more than half of the RVs I see out there have a dishy up on the roof. Oh, I think I know what this is. Elon is working on some kind of modular home. This must be it. Here we have a modern diesel pusher, so let's check it out. Okay. Very modern. Of course, this is basically a commercial for Furion products. Of course, everything is Furion in here because they're the ones. Oh, nice Furion TV. Could be dangerous. That's the, the second floor there. I don't know if I like the colors, but. Got a roof mirror. Where have I seen that before? Okay, one more vintage setup here before we go. Since this one is displayed properly and nicely lit up. Here's a model of an RV manufacturing plant. Oh, we saw the real thing. You saw the real thing at Guanabago. That's summer, so. Yeah, that's pretty much how it looks. And that was it. If there's one piece of advice I can give you, do not come to the uh, RV Hall of Fame in late September here, because they're doing the big open house uh, show, and uh, all the vintage RVs are crammed into this warehouse that doesn't have very good lighting, and uh, it's not the best experience. And uh, other than that, I would have bought a t-shirt, but they didn't have my size. Um, but we still have two more hours to kill, so let's see what uh, we can do here in town. Actually, I got a call, and Minitini 4 is ready for pickup, so here we are. Well, good morning from Indiana. We're about, uh, I don't know, about 70 miles uh, north of Louisville here. And uh, yeah, I didn't film all that much at the mothership. Uh, we got some repairs done in Minitini 4, you know, mostly stuff that we had broken in Alaska. Now, the journey continues, we're heading south, we're gonna drive through Louisville, Lexington, eventually, at some point later today, we'll make it uh, to Knoxville, then Asheville, and eventually Orangeburg, uh, South Carolina, where we're gonna do a, Head north toward North Executive Drive. an oil change on Starship here, and they're finally gonna put that module that shorted out where we were in Alaska. So we'll finally gonna have a, you know, trailer lights gonna be able to drive at night again. So it's gonna be mostly a driving day, four or five hours, and uh, I'll enjoy the ride. Let me tell you something. I would love to linger for a couple of weeks and experience fall. The leaves are starting to turn here in Indiana too, but we must go home. And home is south where the leaves are still green, where the leaves are always green.
We're about to cross the Ohio River onto Louisville, Kentucky. the foothills of the Appalachians. Pretty soon we'll be in Tennessee. There's supposed to be downtown parking in downtown Knoxville, so we're gonna try that first. And since we've never been there, maybe we can explore a little this afternoon. The aforementioned RV park is supposed to be located at the Knoxville Auditorium and Coliseum but there's not a whole lot of information online, so we don't know what to expect. It is always a little nerve-wracking driving into downtown with the trailer in tow, but sometimes you gotta do it. You just have to be aware of what you're towing behind, make wider turns, and being short certainly helps. Well, this seems to be it, but it is full. There's a game or some kind of event going on. Once again, we need a plan B. Actually, we're going to continue down to Sevierville. There are a few campgrounds there, although it is a super touristy area. Here we are, and there's a brand new Bucky's here. Huge, and super busy, so we're gonna skip it for now. On the other hand, we found a campground called Dumpling Valley Farm RV Park. And let's see what it looks like. A part of us feels like going into Gatlinburg for some nocturnal fun, but it is not the time. This was certainly not part of the plan. I mean, today nothing was part of the plan. <laughs> uh, I don't even know the name of this place. I'll, I'll, I'll write it down somewhere. But it's like a farm. We're just outside Sevierville, uh, Tennessee. And the plan was to park at this parking lot. In, we even have cows back there. Uh, the, the plan was to park at this parking lot in downtown uh, Knoxville. We've never been to Knoxville, but um, but the parking lot was full, it was like for seasonal. Uh, it's, it's like the it's a RV parking, but it's part of the, the arena there, the, the community, I forget the name, I'm tired. But we're only an hour and a half away from our next destination, which is, which is Asheville. And we are going to spend the whole day in Asheville. But this is super nice. Wanna relax? We're going to fix our microwave so we can make pizza now, our, our convection microwave. <laughs> yeah, we're not going to do anything in this area. I'm super tempted to unhitch and go into Sevierville or Pigeon Forge or even Gatlinburg, but we're not going to do it. It is a brand new day. This was a pretty nice campground. We might return here someday. Actually, let's stop by Bucky's. 
This one is one of the newest and largest ones. Perhaps this was a bad idea. Uh, this was definitely a bad idea. Some of these new destination buckies are impossible. Needless to say, we're not going inside. I pulled in as far forward as I could, so not to block traffic. Good thing our trailer is short. Well, Buckies is becoming a little more of a challenge these days being so busy, but gas at 305, you kind of have to take advantage of that. We'll see how we get out of here, because in Buckies people have the tendency of just parking their vehicles at the pump and going inside. Very disconsiderate. There they are, taking forever, and I'm like, hold my beer. Well, we began this trip by going to Asheville, visiting our friends from Waynesville, and that's kind of how we're going to end it. And we've been there before, so no, we're not doing the Biltmore. They don't want you to film inside anyway, or the Blue Ridge Parkway for that matter, or anything like that. We're just going to see some of the things we missed in our previous visits, like the Grove Park Inn being one of them. Asheville is a quirky, fun town, often called the San Francisco of Appalachia. We're staying at the Asheville East KOA Holiday, and we've been here before, several years ago in 2017, it used to be $40 per night. This is by the way a lovely campground, with several lakes, it is actually very nice. our site. Not bad. Not bad at all. All right, let's go into town. Hello, hello there. Se asustó. Hay dos. There's another one back there. Yes. That happened as we were leaving the campground, and I feel I must apologize for the video quality. I think it is time to retire the old Sony X3000. It is more than six years old, so I think I got my money's worth. Anyway, here we are. We're gonna try and see if we can get a table at the Sunset Terrace, from where you get great views of the Blue Ridge and downtown. The hotel was built in 1913, out of rough granite stones, in the arts and crafts style. Hmm, the more you know. I think this view is what the hotel is most famous for. We're having an IPA, of course, chickpea soup, and the smash burger. Just not the best view from our table. Well, we just had lunch here at the, at the famous Grove Park Inn. And, uh, Maybe we'll have a, a digestive here, sitting down with this view. Oh, it is here too, by the way. Here we are. It's called an old Cuban. A variation of an old fashioned, I suppose, with rum instead of bourbon. Well, oh, here's an old Cuban drinking an old Cuban. Oh, wow, I mean, I mean. With a view. It is a great place to relax and admire these beautiful views of the Blue Ridge. Not cheap, but then again, you only live once. They even have a robotic lawnmower. That's what we need at Pelicamp. Here's a Ford Model T in the lobby and the historic elevator. Here's the view from a different angle. And I think this is all we're gonna do today. Oh, 
a good morning. Let's walk around the campground a little bit. Yeah, it is definitely a great setting here with all these lakes. And there are hiking trails around the lakes. It is definitely more than a place to park your RV with a view of your neighbor's sewer by your picnic table. This is definitely an idyllic place, nestled in the foothills of the Blue Ridge. Okay, let's go back to Asheville. There's some kind of festival happening here today. Okay, let's park. Seven feet clearance, so no problem. Starship is six seven. Last time we were here we wanted to eat at this tapas restaurant called Curate, but the wait time was ridiculous, so today we made a reservation, and we still have some time to kill. And here we are in Asheville, North Carolina, and there seems to be a pride celebration today going on. We're gonna go eat and then we might uh, walk around a little bit. That's a cool sphere. As I was saying, let's go eat and we'll come back later. Yeah, it's one of those uh, serendipitous things that you can't plan for. You know, you come into a town and there's a celebration. There it is coming up ahead, curate, which in Spanish means literally cure yourself alluding to the curative effects of sharing good food and wine with family and friends. We begin with a good Rioja and some olives with lemon, rosemary and thyme. Chistorra and chips and croquetas de jamón. Mm. There's bread, of course. Saute shrimp. Potatoes and spicy sauce. Potatas Spanish coffee. Was truly outstanding and very authentic. But this place, Guarate, exceeded my expectations, and I had high expectations. It was very good. Always good to see street musicians.
Here's the courthouse building, and it looks like there's going to be a live band here at the main stage. Y'all, these folks are from Charlotte, and they play all over the region. Any of y'all like the Red Hot Chili Peppers? fun to listen to a live rock and roll band, although today I can only share snippets of their performance, for obvious reasons. Nashville is a very musical city, and also very walkable, so let's explore a little bit on foot. The blue glass sphere or orb on display here outside the Asheville Art Museum is a work called Reflections on Unity by Henry Richardson. Here's perhaps the world's largest iron, one of the largest for sure. Very appropriate since we are in front of the Flat Iron Building, which seems to be undergoing renovations. Mara Clutterbox, Neurodiverse Universe. Interesting. Here's the Grove Arcade, dating back to 1929. It was one of America's first indoor shopping malls. But first, let's go to Hemingway's Cuba for a refreshing mojito. It is a rooftop restaurant here in the Cambria Hotel with spectacular views of the Blue Ridge. And if you recall, we came here at the beginning of this trip. Very nice views all around, and a good place to take a break, and probably a great spot from where to see the sunset over the Blue Ridge. Hmm, 7.15, we might come back. You never know. Oh, this is that famous Grove Arcade. The architecture is Tudor Revival or Late Gothic Revival. It looks very, very cool. It almost looks like something you would find in Paris. Let's see this side. Yeah, it is built on a hill, so there is a slope. That's unusual. Let's see what else we can stumble upon. Well, Asheville is home to the Pinball Museum. Here's the Pinball Museum. World famous. That's what I'm talking about. I decided to just take some pictures instead of video, but it is a very cool place. It almost feels like we've traveled back in time into the mid-1980s. Actually, very cool place. It wasn't exactly what I expected. I expected to see like a museum, museum, you know, <laughs> and it's like an arcade. You know, you can play with all the pinball machines and they have like all these vintage uh, video games. And I'm very impressed. A lot of them, there's, they're still, you know, keeping those old CRTs alive. A, a lot of these vintage machines, you know, they have replaced the screens with LCDs, but a lot of them, they're still using the original CRTs. That's very cool. Um, now let's check out the, the cathedral. Check it out, party bike. Well, if you're gonna drink, might as well burn off some of those empty calories, right? <laughs> Speaking of the cathedral, it is the Basilica of St. Lawrence, completed in 1909. It is supposed to be very pretty inside. 
with Italian statues of saints, beautiful stained glass windows, two different chapels. It is closed. Apparently, Beer City Comic Con is happening this week too. No wonder we saw someone dressed as Batman earlier. Well, serendipity, as really is happening today, we've got Comic Con back there, we've got the, the, the Pride Festival. Let's see what else we encounter here. Here we've got a community garden. Check it out. Pretty cool. They're selling all kinds of stuff here. We have five seconds. Tres, dos, uno. Let's do it. More street musicians. And they have a washed up bass. I would love to hear them play. You know I love the music of Appalachia. And uh, let's end our day at the coffee bus. Well, you know I have to have my mid-afternoon espresso. Especially after that meal and the wine. Yeah, you order outside and you pick up inside. Oh yeah, cheers. It's worth it. It's pretty good. Yep. Yeah, I'm a simple man. I just like my espresso plain and strong. These days I don't even put sugar in it. That's all we're gonna do in Asheville this time around. If you want to see our 2017 video where we did a lot more and I looked a lot younger, well, there will be a link somewhere. Let's go to the main building because they are supposed to have live music tonight. This is the Swannanoa River here. Such a great location, this campground. Dancing round and round But my heart can take no more way to end the day, listening to live music and enjoying the great afternoon weather. Asheville will return soon. Well, today is just going to be a driving day. And once we get away from the mountains, a not so scenic drive, so I'll spare you the details. We're going to Space Dock to finally fix the issue with Starship's running lights. In an older vehicle, it would have been just a fuse, but in this one it's a whole computer module that needs to be replaced. So we're staying, as usual, at Santee Lakes KOA, and tomorrow we're going to Ferry Chevrolet in Orangeburg, South Carolina to get all that taken care of. This, by the way, a very nice campground as well. Next to a lake. And they even have pizza.
I hope you have enjoyed this late summer trip, the last one of 2023. On the next one will be staycation of sorts. We're going to spend some time in South Florida preparing for the next adventure. We're going to get on a boat and we're going to walk as well. And eventually we'll clean up Pelly Camp, which as you can see is a little bit of a mess still. Until then, thank you so much for watching and see you on the road. Riding in my RV. <laughs>